Good morning, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> okay, today's scripture comes from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and, you shall be, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, church. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ as an elder and pastor of Fellowship City, along with Reino Meyer, sent out to plant Fellowship City. And this morning, I have the privilege of sharing the word of God with you, opening the word of God. So we're in a series titled Deeper. Um, through this series, we present an invitation, an invitation to know deeper, an invitation to understand deeper, an invitation to experience deeper, an invitation to listen deeper, an invitation to transform deeper, an invitation to see deeper, an invitation to feel deeper, an invitation to read deeper, an invitation to love deeper, an invitation to give deeper, and an invitation to share deeper, an invitation to walk with Jesus Christ. So why? Why an invitation to go deeper? Because we're a disciple-making church, and we are trusting God to awaken our hearts and minds to accept the invitation that God gives. We believe that going deeper enables a greater grasp and, uh, grasp and an understanding to a context that we live in, and then we're able to apply the Bible um, to that context with that greater grasp of what the, the Bible gives. Um, like Marty said, um, you need to know the truth, um, and you know the truth by reading the Word of God. This morning we will see an invitation, an invitation for a reformed heart, an invitation to hear or listen, an invitation to love. We will see an invitation for blessing and life. May we choose and accept this invitation as we hear the words of God. Star Wars is a series franchise that I know nothing about but I do know that there is a famous saying that many of the fans use. May the force be with you. Um, this saying is so entrenched in, in that culture that sometimes they say, may the force uh, be with you, signifying, uh, I guess, a day in the week or a day in the month, rather. Um, Walt Disney, not the company, um, is a man, um, an American animator. He created Walt Disney, the company. Um, from the company, Walt Disney, there's Disney Park. Um, Walt Disney is thought to have said these words, if you can dream it, you can do it. Um, these words are well known to have been part of a saying from Walt Disney, but actually they are from Tom Fitzgerald, who helped create one of the attractions within the Disney Park. So they were not said by Walt Disney, well known to have been said by Walt Disney, but actually by Tom Fitzgerald. Martin Luther King, gave a speech in 1963 calling for civil and economic rights as well as the end to racism in the United States. While giving his speech, he pauses and starts to give an improvised speech, which was later titled, I have a dream, because of the repetition of the words, I have a dream, during the speech. This morning we will see words that should resonate with Christians, words that should be in our hearts, words that should be on our lips, and they should be expressed in everything that we do. These words are part of the greatest command as given by Moses from God, as Moses is a mediator between God and Israel. The same words are given by Jesus, the ultimate mediator between God and all nations. The words we have heard when Ben read the teaching text this morning, and we will see it in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 9. This morning we will see that words are important. We will see and also experience the words of God and how we ought to respond to the words of God. We will see words from God that we should keep in our hearts. We have three points this morning. Overview of Deuteronomy, the words of God, and what are we going to choose? Let me pray for us as we get into God's word. 
Lord, we thank you that this morning we can come before your throne, we can come together together as your people to fellowship, to sing songs of praise and worship, and to sit under your word. I pray against any distractions this morning. I pray that you'd help us to um, remove the things that are coming after today or things that are coming this week or things that have happened in the past. Help us to focus on you and what you would want to say to us. I pray that you'd speak through my vocal cords and I pray that people would hear your words. People's hearts would be changed. And I pray for the Holy Spirit to continue the good work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible. Together with the first four books, they're called the Torah, which means teaching. All five books, including Deuteronomy, are written by Moses. The last chapters of Deuteronomy are, are not written by Moses as he was much older, around 120 years old at that point from, verse, from chapter 30. We know that Moses wrote most of the book um, because we see it in the book. Deuteronomy 1 verse 1 says, these are the words Moses spoke uh, to all Israel across the Jordan. And Deuteronomy 31 verse 9 says, Moses wrote down this law. The word law here is important because it references the name of the book, which is Deuteronomy, which is derived from the Greek word Deuteronom, Deuteronomion, which means second law. Um, Deuteronomy is Moses' last writing as God's messenger to Israel and presenter of Israel's request to God. Moses pleads with Israel to live like God has instructed them, to live according to the words of God shared through the prophet. So let's put the book into context before we focus specifically on Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 to 9. In Genesis, we see Adam and Eve who are in perfect relationship with God. A holy God walks and lives among his holy people and Adam and Eve. Things take a bad turn. Sin enters the world through disobedience of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are then no longer in a perfect relationship with God and no longer a holy people. One of the descendants of, Abraham, of Adam and Eve in Abraham has promises from God. Abraham's promises from God is that he would be the father of many nations and these nations will have a covenant relationship with God and God will live among his people specifically in the land of Canaan. Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers speak about Israel, their saving from Egypt, and their receiving of the 613 laws through Moses at Mount Sinai. It is important to note here that God saves them first, then they receive the law. They don't receive the law to be saved by the law. The purpose or the main theme of the laws is so that the people of Israel can be shaped by the law so that they become holy like God is holy. Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. We see this in, in the book of Leviticus. So the law has to make the Israelites holy so that they can mirror the character of God. The laws were supposed to transform the people and make them holy. They would then live with the holy God as per the original design that we see in Genesis. Deuteronomy 4 verse 5 reads as follows, Look, I have taught you statutes and ordinances as the Lord my God has commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to possess. Carefully follow them, for this will show your wisdom and understanding in the eyes of the peoples. When they hear about all these statutes, they will say, This great nation is indeed a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God near to it as the Lord our God? is to us whenever we call to him. And what great nation has righteous statutes and ordinances like the entire law I set before you today. So the law is useful for wisdom and for building understanding, for building righteousness, which basically means moral, right nature, character, and behavior. However, if you read the five books, you, you realize that Israel is not able to keep the law. They aren't able to be obedient to the laws given to them. They aren't able to internalize the words of God through the prophet Moses. There is then a future work that God has to do to transform the people. This future work is through Jesus Christ, and the transformation happens through the heart. After Exodus, the Israelites are going to the promised land. We see in the book of Numbers, en route to the promised land, that the Israelites send 12 people to go check out the promised land. The scouts return, mostly coming back with bad news, fear for their safety, uh, as they would go into the promised land. They've already forgotten the provisions of God that's come before in Exodus. All the people continue to grumble 
at the thought of this promised land. They would rather go back to Egypt uh, rather than enter the promised land for fear of death and fear of enslavement. If they listened to God, they would know that the promised land would bring blessing and freedom. They continue to grumble and fight against leadership and fight against entering the promised land right through the book of Numbers. So the first 11 chapters of Deuteronomy, Moses speaking about the rebellion of Israel over the last 40 years as they wandered uh, the wilderness. In chapter 1, we see a journey of 11 days from Horeb, which is another name for Mount Sinai, to Kadesh Barnea by way of Mount Seir, which is just across the Khan. Uh, this, this journey takes the Israelites 40 years instead of 11 days. It takes them 40 years instead of 11 days because of the grumbling. So God lets the grumbling generation then to die out in that 40 years, and Moses stands with the next generation to instruct them as they enter the promised land. Moses then pleads for them to be different from their parents, to be different from their ancestors, to follow the law and the word of God, to respond to the grace of God with love and obedience. He reminds them of the grace and love of God, how God has carried them, provided and protected them. Then he instructs them to respond to that using Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 9. And we'll focus on that shortly. So the two main words are hear and love, which we will see as we grapple with this text. The Israelites are about to enter the promised land where there are already different nations who are obeying different gods and serving other gods. Moses is preparing the Israelites to enter this promised land. If they listen and obey, they will be part of the nation who are blessed from the promises of Abraham. Chapters 12 to 26 is Moses clarifying and explaining the law, which they've already heard, but Moses enabling the current generation to understand this law, bringing the, the law to this current generation so that they would understand it and obey it. If they obey it, they will be blessed. And if they don't listen, they will be cursed and they will, be, they will experience famine in the land and they will be exiled from the land. So Moses sets before them blessing or curse, life or death. Moses, if you read Deuteronomy, knows that they will find it hard to listen to the words of God because the Israelites are not righteous and can't live up to the law because of the overarching human condition, which he links back to Genesis. Adam and Eve had the choice of blessing or curse, life or death, but they chose death. Moses doesn't say choose wisely. He says choose life. Moses doesn't grow cold to the Israelites because... um, because God promises to transform the hearts of the Israelites. This, this, this depicts how the history of Israel reflects a profound truth about the gospel, that there is an overarching human condition that chooses death if there is no transformation of the heart. God therefore makes a way through Jesus to ultimately be the greatest lamb as sacrifice for Israel's sins because Israel can't keep the law. Jesus ultimately at Passover with disciples signifies himself as the Lamb of God that would be crucified for their sins once and for all. So quick recap as we sort of end this context. Moses wrote the book, he wrote it to the Israelites as as his last plea to them to hear the words of God because their ancestors didn't hear the words of God and now they will not see the promised land. Moses calls them to be better, to listen and love as they enter the promised land. What is the lens in which we ought to understand this context? We should remember that if we have believed in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, then we are descendants of Abraham who will be blessed. This message, that, this message then is also for us sitting here. We know Jesus as Lord and we ought to be going deeper in our knowledge and love for God as God through the Holy Spirit makes us more and more like Jesus Christ. So we should hear the words of God through the prophet Moses and grapple with what these words mean for us. These words should start to transform us. Second point, the word of God. So Moses in verse 4 starts with the word hear. The word hear in English is, is to perceive that a sound has been made. However, the Hebrew word used here, shma, is the Hebraic idea of paying attention to what is being spoken about and to act upon it. So it is not just to hear, but to act upon it. There's, a, there's an action out of the word. A quick side road. Shema, meaning here, is also known as the start of the most important Jewish prayer. This prayer is Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 9. 
This Jewish prayer is so important to Jewish tradition that Jesus uses this prayer to answer a question. Which commandment is the greatest? We see this question and interaction in Mark chapter 12, verse 28 to 31. One of the scribes, a scribe is basically someone who has the knowledge of the law and wrote legal documents. So this learned individual um, about the law of God asks God, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus starts off by quoting Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 9, which is the most important Jewish prayer. Jesus responds, the most important is, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. Okay, so Moses, when starting with the word here, here, is saying pay attention to these words um, and act upon these words when we consider the Hebraic idea of the word here. So what are these words that the Israelites should pay attention to and act upon? Let's, let's keep reading in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Moses is starting off by placing importance on who God is and establishing God as the true God before instructing the, the Israelites to love the Lord. Moses starts this in chapter 4, as I sort of gave the overview of that. Moses reminds the Israelites in chapter 4 that they saw a fire at Herob, which is just another name for Mount Sinai. So he reminds them that they saw God. He reminds them that God provided for them and released them from Egypt before they got to Horeb. Deuteronomy 4 verse 32 says, Indeed, ask about the earlier days that preceded you, from the day God created mankind on the earth, and from one end of the heavens to the other. Has anything like this great event ever happened, or has anything like it been heard of? Has a people heard God's voice speaking from the fire as you have and lived? Or has a God attempted to go and take a nation as his own out of another nation? By trials, signs, wonders, and war. By strong hand and outstretched arm. By great terrors, as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. You were shown these things so that you would know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. So Moses is starting with the context of who God is so that they would understand who God is and be reminded of who God is before he proceeds to give them instruction. Moses is saying the Lord is God, the Lord is one, there is no other God. So because God is Lord, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Why does Moses say with all your heart? What does this actually mean? If we consider Proverbs 4 verse 23, guard your heart above all things for it is the source of life. Heart means your thoughts, your desires, your passions, your affections, and your will. So all of these need to be aligned to the Lord. Your thoughts, your desires, passions, affections, and will. If they're not aligned to God, it makes it impossible to love God with all your heart. This is a picture of total devotion. or totally given to God as much as being single-minded in reality. This is a picture of blinkers that you'll see um, on the screen. These are put on race horses. Horses have eyes positioned on the sides of their, of their head instead of in front. This gives the horse 350 degree vision. They, can o they only cannot see behind their heads and directly in front of them. Horses can also switch from binocular to monocular vision. Monocular means they can see both sides of their vision separately. So they can use both of their eyes separately and see different images at the same time. Binocular means they can use or turn both eyes to a single object. Using both eyes gives a better perception. And hence, binocular vision, which is similar to using binoculars, which give, up, uh, which give application of distance and better depth in the perception that you're seeing. So in a sense, Horses can switch between binocular and monocular vision. The blinkers stop the monocular vision and they keep the horse focused on binocular or maybe even tunnel vision, if you were to call it that, which helps in running straight and not being distracted by surroundings while keeping true. 
So love the Lord your God with all your heart means we need to have a blinker on our heart, on our thoughts, desires, passions, affections, and will, so that we aren't distracted by our situations, environment, or passions, but we're completely focused on God. What, what does with all your soul mean? Some people think of soul as um, not a physical element which is trapped inside of our body and released when we die, sort of like a genie in a, a lamp uh, being trapped in that bottle. However, this is not how the Bible interprets and articulates soul. Soul has a, has a Hebrew word, nefesh, which means more than throat, as it is used in texts in the Old Testament, but more encompassing of the entire being of a person. The soul, as positioned or explained by the first five books of, of the Bible, so Genesis, Leviticus, Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, is the whole being of a person. So Genesis 2 verse 7 um, gives us that, that understanding as well. So Genesis 2 verse 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man out of dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. So living being there, the word used there in the Hebrew is soul. So it is the whole entire being. It is not just uh, what, would, what people would think comes out of you when you die. So the soul is the entire being, the throat and the whole being of a person. Leviticus 2 verse 11 speaks about a dead body. And the Hebrew word used here is nefesh, which again indicates that the soul or the entire being is the soul. Because Leviticus would not have then said, Nefesh, which means soul, with a dead body. So soul encompasses the whole entire being. Think of the hymn as the deer pants for the water, my soul, which is nefesh there, longs for thee. This is more than my throat, as in what the deer thirsts for, but rather my, my throat, my being, and my person. So the soul indicates um, the heart, it includes the thoughts, it includes the desires, it includes the passions, it includes the, the affection and the will. And it is more than that. It includes the physical being and all capabilities. It's in how you walk. My wife says, I have a distinct walk. And no, I certainly do not have a distinct walk. But if I were to have one, I would want to adopt Denzel Washington's walk. <laughs> uh, I was tempted to show you a video of training day so you can see this walk but I'm sure many of you have pictured it for a second. So stay with me. Let's remove Denzel Washington's walk from our minds. So, so it is how you walk, you talk, your talents, how you respond to challenges. Um, speaking to Muzi, a brother uh, in Christ who's a member of this church, um, I, I found another brother who shares my driving syndrome in traffic uh, that tests me and, and that my wife often laughs at every now and then. Uh, is, is the, the key, every now and then. So love your God with all your soul means we should love God with everything. Our love of God should be seen in what we say, in how we say it, what we think, should be seen in how we use our hands, with our minds, ambition, actions, behavior, and everything. So what does it mean then to love God with all your strength? In the Hebrew, the word used here for strength is meyot. I think that it sounds like if you were to lift some heavy object, you'd say, meyot, but, but actually the meyot doesn't mean strength. The meyot is used as an adverb, which is grammar, meaning to qualify or amplify the preceding word. So the common word meyot means, or is like the English word very, um, or like the English word much. So you see now how it's an adverb. Um, so we add English lessons in our sermons every now and then. So meyot is used in the Bible, in Genesis, on the seventh day, God says everything is meyot, good, which means everything is very good. Uh, Genesis 4, we see the Hebrew word again, meyot, describing how angry Cain is with his brother. He was meyot angry. So it amplifies the preceding word. So in this context, Moses isn't using strength as in physical strength. He isn't using might as physical might. Consider this before we get to how Moses is using, using word. Consider this. Moses, when saying Israel should love the Lord with all their heart and soul and strength, is building on top of the previous word. Heart means to love God with all your thoughts, desires, passions, affection, and will. Then Moses takes it up a notch. 
He raises the bar and says, love God with all your soul, which includes heart, but is much more. It includes heart, but it includes your whole being as well. Your throat, your body, your gifts and talents. Then Moses raises it up again. Uh, actually, he goes all in with the last one. Strength here translated with the Hebrew word meyod means with everything, with all opportunity, all capacity, all intention. In truth, the root word does not limit the use of the word meyod here. In the Greek, the word used here is power, and in Aramaic, the translation is wealth. So these translations don't actually contradict each other, but rather they complement the main theme. The strength of a person is not how much they can lift. I've seen Mike Mayer pull a deadlift with three other men watching, and they couldn't. But the strength of a person is also what he is available to them, all his resources, even the names he can drop. So in this theme, strength isn't only wealth or power, but it is the very essence of who you are. It is the very essence of who you are, including all you have, all opportunity, capacity, and so much more. It is everything. All of our muchness with everything, wealth, opportunity, capacity, intention, mind, heart, spouse, child, car, house, cell phone, shoe collection. I almost said head collection, but I don't see any hats. Uh, I don't think we're much of a hat church. Um, so your solar installation, your investment portfolio, it is, it is with everything, the word that is used here. So because of the oneness of God, because he is the only true God, he is the God who has made himself known to Israel in many ways, rescuing them from Egypt, providing for them, enabling them to enter into the promised land. He is the true God, the only God, and we see this in verse 4. Because of all this, Israel should love God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their strength. Deuteronomy 6, uh, verse six uh, chapter 6, verse 6 continues, and it says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What Moses is saying in verse 6 is that if Israel is indeed loves God in the way that God calls them to, then the expression of that love will be seen in them keeping the words in their heart. They will know the words. That is how they know the truth. They will know the words. Not only keeping the words, but also teach the words that they've learned. They will live out of the expression of the love of God. Just a side road. Verses 8 and verse 9 speak about one of the Jewish customs called mezuzah, which is Hebrew for a doorpost. So they would use thin, dried-up animal skin uh, at a trained um, sofa, which is like a Hebrew word for scribe. So a scribe would write with a quill and ink on that uh, animal skin, and they would uh, roll up this animal skin and place it in a casing and then mount it on the doorpost of the house. On the other side of, um, on the one side of this animal skin, they would write Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 9, the same passage that we're reading. They would write that, on the one side. On the other side, they would write um, one of the Hebrew names of God, Shaddai, which means God Almighty. So they would roll it up, put it in a casing, mount it on the door. This would be fixed to the right-hand side of the door frame. Some Jewish people would kiss the tips of their fingers as they enter the house and touch the muzah, which is a symbolic of kissing it and the word of God, which it, it contains. So the symbol is then a reminder of their faith and a symbol of God's guardianship over the house and his people. This Jewish custom was practiced as part of obedience to Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 9. These muzas are, are still used by some Christians as a testimony of their love of God. It serves as a reminder to a Christian family to love God, to teach the scriptures to your children in remembrance of Jesus Christ and his blood, which gives life through the cross. Much more important than mounting Emuzah is, is placing the word of God in our hearts. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Having it fixed on the door frame, but not actually life changing or following or obeying this greatest command, not hearing and applying the word as, as Moses calls, does not empower this Muzah. 
So the last point, what are you going to choose? The command that we see here needs our hearts reformed. Moses finds comfort in chapter 30 for the Israelites. We too should find comfort in this. There's two things as we close. The first thing is this. Like the Israelites, we can see God in everything. Like the Israelites. If you wake up in the morning and you see the sunrise, or in the evening when you see the sunsets, or if you see nature, or maybe if you look back at where God has you now from where you have been. Maybe you were sick and God healed you. Or you were broken at loss or of a loved one and he comforted you. Or you struggled to make ends meet and he provided for you. Feeling lost and you found family. God is at work and we know this, like the Israelites, but we cannot love God with our own strength. We are different sitting here this morning because if you have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, then the reformation of your heart has already begun. The hope that Moses had for his people and, his, and the descendants of his people has already started. The Holy Spirit dwells in us and it reforms our heart. The first thing, we can love God in the way that Moses and Jesus in Mark says, without the Holy Spirit. But we do have the Holy Spirit if we have put our faith and trust in the Holy Spirit. The second thing is to not grieve the Holy Spirit like we are in the habit of doing. The Holy Spirit wants to reform our hearts, but sometimes we don't heed or listen to the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit shows you idols in your hearts and some, sometimes by bringing other people, either spouse or friends, we don't listen, we don't hold fast. Uh, we hold fast to greed, we hold fast to pride, we hold fast to slander or to jealousy or to anger, to lust or unhelpful relationships, to living in the dark. Fam, we should not grieve the Holy Spirit. We should be attentive to hearing God speak to us and transform our hearts through the work of the Holy Spirit. So what are you going to choose? Are you going to listen and love? To hear God speak, we read his words. To love him, we read his word and we pray that the Holy Spirit helps us to understand and apply the word of God as we read it. Reading the Bible for all it's worth. We need to read it for understanding. We need to grapple with the word. Where we don't understand, where we're not sure, we need to invite others to help us read the word of God and explore the word of God together. So this is a picture of runners. It is uh, Comrades Day. I would uh, need to put one picture of runners at least in there. So runners may have always loved the sport. Uh, maybe they were disciplined at first in the art of running, in taking in the breeze on your face, in seeing the beauty of the environment you are in. So runners take active steps as well. They run short distances at first. They run regularly. They find the right environment. They find the right gear. They find the glasses, the hats, the shoes. They can then take longer distances. The more they run, the more they enjoy running. Running also re releases dopamine in the brain, which brings in temporary runners high from the exercise. A runner not only loves their craft with a feeling of dopamine in the brain or love of an image of when they crossed the last finish line, but also with action. They run regularly. They share regularly about their running. They speak about what they love. They learn about the latest watch and shoes and clothes that help. If you love the word of God, then you read it, fam. You read it to others, you read it to your kids, you tell others about it, you desire to know more about it, you dig deeper into the word, you find the space and environment to enjoy it more, you invite others into reading it with you, you share the word of God, you read it regularly. As the more you read the word of God, it also releases dopamine in the brain bringing joy as you read the word. But the more you read it, it brings dopamine. Same as runners, the more they run, it brings, uh, it releases dopamine. So in Deuteronomy 6, we see the muzah, which is a visible symbol or outworking of loving God. We also see frontlet mentioned in the same passage. This is like a headband that would have scripture written on it. So we should bind scripture to our hands. We should live it out. It should be that evident that we believe in Jesus Christ. We should also be a praying people. The reformation of our hearts, which we see Moses finding comfort in in Deuteronomy 30, happens through the work of the Holy Spirit. We should continue to bring things in our life that make it, we, sh we should not continue to bring things in our life that make it hard for us to continue um, pursuing um, reformation of our heart. If we have unhealthy relationships, we need to break those off. 
if they are moving us further away from God. And we need to pray about these. If we have anxiety, we need to bring anxiety before God. If we have idols, basically things that, that we treasure more than God, we need to remove them from our hearts and minds. We should have nothing more important than God. In fact, we should use these things as part of miot, as part of who we are, as part of how we love God. We should love God with everything and all of our muchness. If we can't use any of this, anything in our life as part of the expression of our faith, maybe we need to find if these are idols or not. So everything in us should be a part of reflecting on Christ, should be for part of loving Christ. We need to live in community. So who do you share life with? Do these people speak the word of God to you? Do they care for your growth? Do they want to see you become more and more like Christ? Then we need people who can speak the word of God to us, who can remind us about loving God in the way Moses says, who aren't afraid to share with us things they see in our lives that are keeping us further from being more and more like Christ. Then we need to choose life. We choose these by putting God first, by loving God with all our heart, with all our soul, and all our might. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that um, the Holy Spirit dwells within us if we have put our faith and trust in you. And the Holy Spirit helps us to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. We pray that we would continue to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. We pray that we would hear you, Lord God, speak to us through your word. We pray for a hunger and a desire to know you more. And we pray for a hunger and a desire to have our noses planted in your Bible. We pray for our family, brothers and sisters around us that, that we do life with. We pray that you'd enable us to live in community and that we would sharpen one another, that we would um, help one another to become more and more like Christ. We pray that as we read your word, that the Holy Spirit would always be visible and, and, and loud within our ears and in our hearts and minds, the things that we need to change, the things that we need to turn from, and the things that we need to do. We pray that the expression of our faith is visible because that is, as it is visible, it enables us to continue to grow in making it more and more evident. And as it grows more and more evident, then we're able to reflect Christ where you have placed us. I pray that you'd continue to speak to us, say to us those things that you'd want us to know, to say, and to do. And I pray that the meditation of our hearts will be pleasing to you, O oh Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.